What's up? <laughs> Sorry, I was a little abrupt again. Uh, man, I'm, again, like always, I'm just so excited uh, to be um, here with you guys on Sunday morning. Um, this is my favorite day of the week um, to come and just hang out with my family, and that's kind of what we've been uh, talking about. We started last week about parenting on purpose, and we brought uh, our, our children, our family director, our family life director. Um, in which was her last year or last week was her year anniversary with the church. So that's really really cool that she's been with the year and, and what she has done already um, through our family uh, ministries and uh, for our for our children has been amazing. Um, and the the new curriculum that we're going through, she kind of we kind of introduced that together um, on an interview style um, Sunday morning. And uh, so some of the stuff that we talked about was again what you know, legacy of faith looks like and where that came in in Scripture, where that came from. And we, we went through and she went through and we went through from Genesis all the way to Revelation, um, where the legacy of faith is intertwined and Jesus is everywhere in Scripture. And so from Genesis, again, to, to Deuteronomy, where it talks about family and, and Psalms, where they sing songs about the legacy. Um, Ecclesiastes, where the whole book of premises around being together and twined together and everything is meaningless under the sun. Um, and anything that is not connected to the sun is uh, meaningless. Um, and we talked about that just a little bit. Uh, we talked about how the kingdom is coming, that the Great Commission, where Jesus kind of, like uh, Jennifer put it, gave his, her, his last longer room speech, where it says, I'm not going to be with you, but this is what needs to happen. And it's just all throughout Scripture of the beautiful picture of the legacy of the gospel. And we talked about where we came in on that with the Second Timothys um, and Titus 2. And how we're supposed to continue with that. We talked about uh, what encouragement would she give to us or we would give to you um, as a staff. We talked a little bit about that. To find resources that fit. Um, the Right Now Media that we uh, shared during our um, countdown uh, was a, a good resource. You go Right Now Media and put in parenting and there's five or six lessons that call, come right up. Uh, there's Tony Evans. There's Paul Tripp. There's a, there's a couple others that go in there that does parenting well. Uh, Paul Tripp is not someone that I line up with completely everywhere, but he, what he does on parenting is amazing. Um, and so I would recommend that study. So there's resources that you can do outside of here and to and with your children. And we talked about, and we haven't talked about, one of the things that we skipped was what are some challenges that could bring? What, what, what challenges keep us from doing the legacy of faith at home. Um, we're going to go over a couple of those uh, this morning, but we're also going to look at what we can do uh, for our children. Again, I know this is called parenting on purpose, and I know I might preference as a, as a parent to a child, but if you don't have children, or maybe your children are out of the home, I promise you, Jesus can still speak through to you um, through this message. Because each and every one of us, even if we don't have biological children that we are raising up in the home, each and every one of us has a generation that we can impact. Each and every one of us has a friend that we can walk alongside with. So we can actually separate or take away parenting on purpose and put discipling on purpose. And what are you doing to raise up the next generation of followers. And I'm not talking just about age. I'm talking about maybe age of maturity and their spiritual walk. Who are you walking alongside of? Because in some cases, age doesn't really matter. Because I guarantee that I can learn so much from the people older than me. But I can promise you, you could probably learn some things from me. And that's not conceited, that's just saying, even no matter what the age, there's still places that we can learn. There's things that we can learn about life. If you've been married for years, how do you keep your marriage intact? How, how have some of you been married for the Honeycuts? I know, almost 52 years. That's beautiful. Uh, the the, the Neils, I think they're over 50, 52, 53. 
52. Uh, 52 for the 80s. There's so many people that have made the, the mark of 50 years. And that's just the, the ones that I know about that have reached that milestone since I've been the pastor here. So if I left you out, it wasn't on purpose. That's just all I know. Um, but there's so many people who can speak into young couples about marriage. Or maybe there's someone in here that's trying to have children. Or, or expecting a child. Or just had a child. And there's parents in here who do have kids outside the home. You've went through it. You've went through stages of life. And now that you've went through stages of life with your children, you're going back to some of the same stages as grandchildren, and you can see that it is way different. <laughs> and so no matter where you're at or what you're walking through, there's something that can be pulled on parenting or discipling on purpose. And I want you guys to lean into that. If we are going to be the church, if we're going to be more than a gathering, it's got to be more than just me up here speaking a message. Or someone up here speaking a message. It doesn't have to be your pastor every Sunday either, but whoever. It doesn't have to be that. I can literally come to you on Sunday morning. We've talked about this before because it happened to Nehemiah. I can literally come up here and just read Scripture, a book of Scripture. And if you're not touched by the glory of God, that's not my fault. Because I should be mainly in this book anyway. The things that I say in the application, yeah, I'm, I'm more of a, a topical pastor than some or, or more of a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Application. Thank you. I'm really good at what I am. Um, an application. But what comes from it is what comes from Scripture. And yes, I, I do my best and I pray through that God speaks through me to show you how you can take what was written here and apply it to our lives today because the Word never changes. And so that's another thing that I want to say is be, just because Sarah and I we're going to talk about parenting just because Sarah and I do not have our own biological children. We've been through some of the stuff. We've, we've helped raise nieces and, nieces and nephews. We've, we've been in the foster. We've been in children's homes. It's, it's things that we've done, we've been a part of. And just because God has not gave us our own biological children, please don't count me out and say, why is he speaking in here? Because all I'm doing is speaking from the ones who talked into me and spoke into me in those times of raising teenagers. I skipped the kids and went straight to the crazy teens. So, ha! <laughs> but it's the things that we, we fall into and we need to lean on each other because in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with your heart and with your soul and with your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them as bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your commandments. We thank you for the prophets that you spoke through so we have documentation of your words. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the opportunity that I can come up here and share what you've laid on my heart. Lord, I pray for each and every person sitting out there or maybe watching online later. That what you have to say pierces, pierces their hearts and their souls. And Lord, I want to take this opportunity for the church, the people out there to pray for me. Pray for me that I'm just merely a mouthpiece. That I am clear and helpful to what you have.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've already done and what you can continue to do. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so we all, each and every one of us, wants what's best for the children. If it's your kid or someone else's kid, we want what is best. It says in Matthew 7, 11, sorry, that got me. Uh, Matthew 7, 11, so if you are sinful, people know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? So even us, as sinful people, are good gift givers to our children. We want the best. Most of us want the best for our children. We would do anything that we possibly could to make it best. We all have good intentions. We want, what, we want to give kids the best. We, want, we, want, we don't want to wear them down or tie them down, but we want to give them everything that they possibly could ever imagine. But we get tired. We get wore down as guardians. I mean, the first kid... I've seen this with my, my, uh, my brother and, and my nieces and nephews. The first kid, you drop the pacifier, you either get a new one or you go get this one, you put it on the pot, you boil it, you make sure it's clean. The second one, you might put it under some water. The third one, you can even let the dog lick and just pop it right back in the pot. <laughs> and so you get tired, you get wore down. I get it. And, and sometimes we, we go from, we want the best, do what's the easiest. And some of us are really good gift givers when it comes to our grandchildren. My, my, my mom is a lot better gift giver to my nieces and nephews than she ever was me. <laughs> Mad Dog runs that roost and she does great. That's what they call her, Mad Dog. Um, and it, I look at some of the stuff that my, my dad, Pops and Mad Dog does, and it's like, where was this? <laughs> Well, like, they always say, well, we like them. And I'm like, that's fair. <laughs> uh, they've always loved me, but they haven't always liked me. Um, but we want the best. You love your kids. You want to give the kids the best. You want them to be happy. You want them to have the, the best education. You want them to have the cool shoes. You want them to have the trendy jeans. You want them, some of us want them to have the latest phones because we know if they don't have it, the, the, the ridicule or the, the, the positions that we can put them in if they don't have the best of the best. We don't want them, or we get to this viewing of we know that we never had anything, so we don't want our kids to go out without. We don't want our kids to be the one that has to go to the uh, school with Walmart brand stuff, even though Walmart is killing it with clothes now. Um, but again, that's something else that got better after I grew up. But we want those things. We want to make sure that they're safe all of the time. We, we talked about this when I kind of preached on this same passage a few months ago. We talked about we don't want to be risk takers. Sometimes that we, we kind of um, helicopter and we, we don't want them to get hurt. So we, we cause things or, or we, we go ahead of them so they don't really learn what it looks like to be an adult or even a Christ follower because we come in and we want to rescue them before they're even in trouble. And they come with this mentality that they know that they don't have any consequences or anything else because they know that it'll be taken care of. Which is amazing if we do it right. But if we're just rescuing them and not telling them or, or letting them scrape their knees or, or cleaning them up after that and, and explaining and using these as teaching moments, we don't know what could happen. But these are the same things when we want to give all our kids the best. But when does giving hurt? When, do, when are some of these struggles that uh, Jennifer and I didn't get into last week? When does giving hurt? Giving hurts when we give them things they didn't earn. Starts with, you know, what, what fits in the store, the candy, the entitled, uh, what Tony said in our video, the candy, the, the, the cotton candy, where we want it sweet, we want to make sure they have everything, they didn't do anything. I'm not saying that works has to be earned or grace has to be earned because that's kind of opposite of the gospel. But even Jesus makes us safe and gives us salvation freely. But then he lets us learn and choose as we go through life. And we give blessings. And works should come with faith and not works brings faith. But we, we want to make sure that they, we give them things that they didn't 
earn. We have participation rewards. We have trophies for just showing up. Sometimes showing up shouldn't be the reward. It should be expected. If they have something or we have something, especially as Christ followers, if we, if we say we're going to do something, we should have the integrity to make sure that we do it. Because we're representing more than just us. If we're going to give out promises and be there, we should be more than just expected to show up. But we should be there to, to do what we need to do. To do the work that we've been enlisted to. To be the will, to be the hands and feet. We need to do more than just show up. We need to do more than what's just expected. One of the best things we can do is give our children the blessing of earning the blessing. Play video games after you do your chores. Um, if you're going to give them a car, maybe you have them work for half. I'm really glad that my parents didn't make me do that, so that's a new point. Um, phones, didn't buy it, get their own. Make them borrow phones. Make them earn what they have. It's not fair. You're going to hear this stuff. But we, we as Christians, we cry out all the time. It's not fair, God. Man, aren't we so glad, and we've talked about this from the pulpit before, but aren't you so glad that our God is not a fair God sometimes? Because if I got everything that I feel like I should earn, salvation can never be given to me. Because I'm wicked. I'm selfish. I have anger. I have frustration. The things that I have chosen, the decisions that I have made should disqualify me from being where I'm at today. But by the grace of God, and because of justification of our Lord, our mercy of our Father, I praise God that He's not fair. I praise God that He's made tough decisions. I praise God that not everything that I wanted to happen has happened. Because there's so many times where I've prayed for something, got mad at God when He didn't show up, but man, if He answered those prayers, I wouldn't have a lot of the blessings that I had today. I wouldn't have a beautiful wife. I wouldn't be here being your pastor. I'd be miserable at a desk job or owning a feed store. But praise God that He didn't give me everything that I've asked for. Or praise God, He didn't give me everything that I deserve. But His mercy. We give praise when it's not deserved. Because we love our kids. We tell them the smartest, the prettiest, the, the, the best in the world. Studies have shown when, we, when praise is cheap, it robs confidence. Overpraise creates anxiety. And I can see that. I, I have fall. I am a statistic when it comes to that. The more and more that you get praised, the more and more you feel like you have to step up, the more and more you have to be good. Because if it's not the best, or if I didn't have the best game on the mound, or if I, if I struggled at baseball, or if I, I was sick and I couldn't show up to practice, it would destroy me. Because I was living up to expectations that I didn't earn. Because I wasn't always the best. But if I wasn't the best, I wasn't good at all. And depression and anxiety, when those things were pulled from me and all the things that people praised me for all the time was pulled from me. My identities, when baseball was taken away from me, when, when relationships were taken away from me, that's who I was and that's who I fell under. And, and when, even when I was playing the idol of Christian, not even a true Christ follower, but when they pulled the title of Christian away from me, I was destroyed because I had my idea of what Christianity was. What I followed was not true Christianity. It was another thing of, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to get this, and you're going to give me everything that I've ever prayed for. I never said it out loud, but that's the way that I thought, and that's the way that I proceeded things. That's the way that I stepped forward in, in, in non-obedience. Instead of, you're the smartest, change the phrase. It's better to praise the process than to praise the person. These are just little 
forgive me, this is not the biblical, but <coughs> instead of you're the smartest, you worked hard. You brought your best. <coughs> Honor God. <coughs> Works, no. You love for who they are. Praise for what they do. You give them things they didn't earn. You praise that they don't deserve. And we give them freedoms they can't handle. Overprotective in some ways, but foolishly naive in others. Again, this is me, not just as a parent, but sometimes as a, as a leader. There's times where I look back when I've, uh, when I've been in my interns. I've been naive, and, and I gave them more than what they could handle, and they weren't ready for the, the task that I give them as a, as a leader, as a pastor. And they go out and they believe that they failed miserably, and to the point where they didn't want to do it anymore, and they've ran completely away from ministry. Because I gave them, as, as their spiritual parent in that moment, I gave them more than what they could handle. Because I was naive, I, I was maybe even cocky in my own ability, that if you're under me, then obviously you're ready to do this. If we went over this, we've done the studies, we've done the lessons, we've, we've read through scripture, so obviously you're ready. But maybe they were ready in knowledge, but they weren't ready emotionally, they weren't ready mentally. And they just weren't ready for the task physically. And the same thing is when we raise our children. Maybe we're more trustworthy, more responsible, and more freedoms as we gradually transfer dependence from us to dependence on God. And we're going to get there in just a second. We need to take this off of us. We give them a middle schooler a phone that maybe they're not ready for. I'm not saying all middle schoolers. I'm not saying if your middle schooler has a phone Shame on you, you uncrushed Christian person. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying make sure that you're parenting on purpose. That you're walking alongside. And you're not giving them total freedom, a freedom that they're not ready for. Because that's where we can uh, start addiction to porn. We can start addiction to sexual activity through text messaging. We can create FOMO. Isolation, depression, anxiety. Because they are so focused on what's in their hand that we didn't, we didn't raise them or we didn't parent on purpose or disciple them through this new stage of life. We kind of just gave them, and I believe that you can handle it because I do everything else right. Well, maybe they're not ready for that, so make sure you walk alongside them. Because again, Deuteronomy 4 through 9 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These com commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them a symbol on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Every step in life, make sure they can see and hear the gospel. Love your God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And tie them up. Every, every conversation that you have is sandwiched somewhere because of Jesus. Every decision that you make is because it's a decision through the eyes and the lens of Jesus. Even when you make a mistake, repent and apologize to the eyes of Jesus. Everything you do as a disciple or a parent, make sure that the gospel in Jesus is right out front. Three gifts you can give your children. A community worth having, a standard worth achieving, and a faith worth sharing. These are the things that you need to fall into. These are the things, and these are the gifts, the good gifts. So we're really good at, at gift giving, but even the, the sinner can give good gifts, but they're not eternally gifted. And so let's make sure we... Concentrate on that. Number one, a community, uh, a community worth having. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Jewish, the, the Jewish family was way more intimate than our family is today. The, the, the family uh, commitment, the family communication, it was, parent, it was parents, children, uh, child spouses, grand cousins, nieces, nephews, workers, as many as 80 being in one community and sometimes even in the same commune uh, and areas in the same household. They did everything together as family. They made sure that they leaned into each other. Family was a big deal. Even to the point where sometimes the family was worshipped over God. So to Israel, so when they said, O oh Israel, the Lord our God. He was talking about the community to make sure that you give them a community worth having. Set up your kids with with spiritual success. Help them find, build, intentional, Christ-centered community. Let them see you have Christ-centered community. Have them see you that, that, that meeting together is a priority. That the gathering is a priority. That you don't, uh, you don't neglect the gathering, whether it is a Sunday morning service or even more than that. Maybe it's a life group. Maybe it's getting together as a family and reading Scripture. Make sure that your children or the people that you're discipling, raising up, you see and you can see what community and Christ-centered community, how important it is in their growth and their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we each know that each and every one of us, children and children included, are going to try to find their people. They're going to be influenced by something or someone. So why not teach them even who they hang out with or where they go or where you go that you're intentional about having Christ-centered community. Who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. Each and every one of us are influenced by somebody. Whatever you did growing up, you didn't do it alone. Or maybe it's because you did it alone. It's because the reason you were doing it alone is because of the people you were around. Maybe the people that you put yourself in or people, the Christ-centered people that were supposed to take care of you. Maybe the pastor and the parents, the ones that were supposed to be responsible, took advantage of that, that position, took advantage of that love. And because of that, the decisions that you made or the life that you're in is a lot to do with the context that your parents or your guardians or the people that you were supposed to trust put you in. What you do and the decisions you make is not because you did it alone. It's the context that you're in. We've talked about context a lot. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools. Get in trouble. But I've got no control over my kids' friends. I'm helpless. That's one of the things. I have no control who they hang out with or who they see. You can't pick your children's friends, but you can influence the environment you put them in. So if you're intentional about the environments that you put them in, God can show through. Make sure that they have mentors. Make sure that you're, you're putting them in. Uh, make sure that they're sending off to summer camps, mission trips, intern at a church if they're old enough. There's a lot of things and environments that you can help them get into. Your son doesn't have to be on the best baseball team all the time. If that best baseball team that he's on is bad influences and pulling them away from Christ, maybe we look at, he can still play baseball, but maybe we find a team that's going to influence good decisions and influence Christ-like decision making. A good influence. Maybe the, they're on the best team, but their coach uh, does not show Christ or how they take care of it. It's all about winning. It's all about one thing. They don't care. The process is more than the people. But maybe it's time that you look and maybe you put your kid or put your influence on the team that's going to show the love of Christ. A spiritual community worth having. Two are better than one. We've said this, it just isn't my faith, it's our faith. It's your faith alone, but you don't do faith alone. Find yourself a community. Give them a community worth having. And then number two, a standard worth achieving.
6 5 says this love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. If you don't expect much from your kids, you won't get it much. If you believe that they're capable of more, then likely they will believe it too. Believe in your kids. Believe that, that they're not young enough, or they're too young, or they're too immature to learn more about Scripture. Bring them up with what the Bible says. Don't sugarcoat Scripture. Share them the gospel. Give them the real gospel. How to love God with all their heart. Instead of letting them watch TikTok or giving them a phone to, to quietly play in the corner, give them a devotional. Let them read up Jesus. Watch, let them watch children um, Christ uh, raising and Christ quality content. Take a stand. Be with the, have your family memorize a verse a week. Well, I don't know much, Trevor. How can I raise my kids if I don't know a lot? Well, learn with them. Walk alongside with them. Pick a verse, memorize it together, and then show each other that the work that you've done, the love that you put in, it's things that we can fall into and the things that we can look at. And it's not too late. Again, maybe your kids are out of town. Again, this is not a, I hope you feel bad about the way that you raise your kids if it's too late. This is to find someone in the church that you can do the same thing. Have Christ community with them. Give them something worth achieving. Find a younger couple and you guys memorize scripture together. Maybe as a church, maybe there's a scripture that we can put up and we can do something like, hey, if you come to the pastor or one of the leadership and give this praise, we'll give you a high five. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to buy a whole bunch of gifts, but it's one of those things. Then make sure you're memorizing scripture together. Look at different plans. Take a stand on what they watch. Make sure that you have um, sexual integrity. Instead of listening to music with ungodly lyrics, let them listen to worship music. I don't, it doesn't have to be just worship music, but make sure what they are listening to isn't questioning the integrity of the decisions that they're going to be making as an adult. Or decisions they're making now. Because adulthood and adult decisions are getting younger and younger and younger as we go. The influence and the enemy and the trash that our kids are being exposed to all the time is heartbreaking. But that's where we take a stand. That's where we have the great condition. And that's where we make sure that our goal is to have the best player or the best kid. That we have the strongest witness. That they're not trying to fit in, but they're, they're, they're standing out. There's something different. Yes, will that bring some ridicule and, and, some, and, and some persecution towards your, your child? It could. But also raise them and show them how to take that on. To have conversations about that. To be in the world, but not of the world. You can do all of this if you're intentional or discipling or parenting on purpose. So it's a faith we're sharing. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at the home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Make talking about God the most common and the most normal topic in your home. Make it common for them to hear what Jesus has done and what Jesus has is doing. We want faith in God to be the first hand faith. Not just yours as parents, but theirs. Challenge your kids. Make them hate fake. Make them have a genuine relationship. Not make them, but share them and show them how to have a true, authentic faith in Jesus. Not a Christian family, but a Christ centered family. Christ is not just part of your life. It is your life. It's everything. It's the first when you wake up. It's the last thing that you do when you go to bed. If you as a parent know that Jesus changed your life, we should each strive that He's not a part of the life, but He impacts the whole legacy of the family.
We talked about faith legacy. Continue that faith legacy in your homes, with your family, with your sphere of influence. If you don't have a family at home, or maybe you're single, maybe you're single, maybe, uh, like I said, you haven't been married yet, or maybe you haven't had your own kids, each and every one of us have a sphere of influence, and we can do this. Disciple or parent on purpose. It's because what Christ did for us. If we don't make that the most important thing in our lives, we're robbing them. You say you love your kids. But if you don't show them Jesus, if you don't witness to them, if you don't put them in environments that they can see Jesus, we're missing. I can almost say the exact same thing that I, I told that story about um, Teller, the, the guy who does tricks, magic tricks. I'm not going to try to say the musician. magician. I did it. Um, he said he doesn't believe in what you say. He doesn't believe in this Christ thing. But in his mind, if, if we are so in love with this Jesus guy, and we believe what we actually say that we believe, how can we hate him so much that no one ever shared Jesus with him? Until this old man tried to. So it's the same thing with our families. If we say that we love our children, and we would do anything for our children. How can we hate our family so much that we wouldn't show them the love and the hope and the only hope that they can have? Because we worship idols. We don't just worship idols in our own lives, but we worship idols through our family. We each have something that we want our families to achieve. Obviously, we want prosperity. Obviously, we want them to be taken care of. We want health. We want all of these things. But we want them to have a true, authentic faith in Jesus Christ the most. And make sure that we do that on purpose. Because He died for us. The sins and the, and the punishment that we deserve. Thank God He's not a fair God. Because He hung on that cross. And die for our sins. Ridiculed, mocked. What we deserved. And between two real thieves, two real criminals, the perfect one hung in the middle of them. And just like those criminals, we have a decision to make. Are we going to recognize who we are, but more importantly, recognize who He is? Are we going to reject it and turn away from it? That is the two choices that we have. It's important that we look at these things because I want to, I want to give you this last testimony while we're getting ready. We're about to partake in our uh, communion, our Lord's Supper. And we do this because we remember, like we just talked about, we remember what Jesus died for us. And in this moment, when we partake in our Lord's Supper, all I want you to do, and this is, this is what I want to say, we are open, we are a church that's open to communion. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in communion with us. But you do, because Scripture tells us this, you do have to have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to be a Christ follower. How can you do something in remembrance of something that you've never accepted? And so here in just a few minutes, we're going to have the, uh, the, the songs back up, and we're going to have a time of response. And if there's something or something in your heart that you need to uh, repent of, something that you need to give over to God, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you if there's uh, some a grudge or, or some anger or some things against someone, that you give that to God at this moment. But if you don't have a true and meaning, meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray that you take this moment to reach out to God and see where you stand with Him. And I want to read this if I can find it real quick. I have, I have a note. If I can't find it, we'll move on. But. Until it shows you 
how much I wanted to give, give this uh, a story to you that I, that I heard and was told to me of the importance of parenting on purpose or, or, or doing what we need to do or, or even just sharing the gospel. It doesn't even have to be a parent. And in this case, it wasn't a parent. In this case, it was actually a student to a teacher. And so this guy named was Reggie. Reggie was uh, in, in uh, the, special, the special classes, and uh, he was actually um, diagnosed with, with Down syndrome and, and very severe Down syndrome and autism both. And so he wasn't very verbal. But the only things that he ever said, or, or he, could, he could get some sentences out, but every morning he would come in and talk to Dave. Dave was his teacher. And every morning all he would say is, I love you, and so does God. Every morning, for three years, he was in this classroom. Every morning, Reggie would come in and say, God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. And this was all said to him, and Dave was actually a raging alcoholic. He would go into school, he would do his thing, he would take care of his thing. Obviously, he had a heart for people and a heart for students, but he'd go home and he would drink for the rest of the day. That's all he did. He was, he was literally a, addicted to alcohol to the point where if he was not at school grounds, he had alcohol in his hand. And, he, and, he, and he, he was angry, he was mad at the world, but the only place he found a little bit of peace was with the students because he knew that he needed to take care of them. But he had this one guy, he hated God. We had this one student for three years. I love you, and so does God. God loves you, and so do I. That's all I would say. Well, three years into this, Dave ended up actually having a serious car accident. He thought he was, they thought he was going to die. They thought he was going to uh, pass away. He was in a coma for, for a while. I'm not exactly sure exactly how long, but he woke up. And when he woke up, he remembered the words. God loves you, so do I. So the impact of always having that in, you might not be the one, or you might not see the transformation that Jesus did, but because of that moment, and because of that area, the first thing that popped into Dave's mind when he woke up was little Reggie. I love you, and so do I. I think I said Dave was in the car accident. It was actually Reggie, the child, the student. And so Dave would go every day to make sure that Reggie was okay. He would go check on him and check on him and check on him. Reggie didn't end up making it. But at Reggie's funeral, the gospel was presented again. And because of the three years of Reggie being an obedient servant of Christ, not very few or very many words could be uttered, but he could utter the words, God loves you, and so do I, with a big hug. And then he heard the gospel again from the preacher at that funeral, and he understood what it said. He, he, felt, he felt that. He saw it every day. Someone who, who shouldn't have anything, the ones who was dealt a bad card in a lot of people's opinion, knew that God loved him. No matter where I'm at, no matter what my situation, God loves me, and so do I. And because of his obedience and, and being in that area and putting yourself and being intentional about the Christ community, a life was changed. And in, because of Dave, he changed his mind. He, he, he found the Lord. He became strong. And he kept on going. And Dave... Dave actually ended up um, leaving the school and coming, working at the phone, the, the Bell Phone Company, um, back when people actually had phones in their house uh, and not just cell phones. Um, and you actually had to have someone. And then Dave ended up working there, and he started sharing the gospel with the people that he went with. And he actually shared the gospel um, with Mike and Glenda. And Mike and Glenda ended up. Uh, again, Mike and Linda still had their own struggles, but they ended up accepting the Lord. And because of that, and because of that family, 
They, they, uh, because of that witness, they ended up raising their children in a Christ-centered home. And because of that Christ-centered home, their kid grew up to be a pastor. And that pastor became a missionary. And because of that missionary and the obedience that that family had, and because of that pastor, he is now the director of North American Mission Board. And so he's touching lives everywhere. All because Reggie, a kid that had all odds against him, made sure that the gospel was clean symbols on his fingers. And it was posted on his forehead. God loves you. And so do I. So let's be intentional when we love our kids. Let's be intentional when we raise our children. Let's be intentional when we have the sphere of influence. Make sure that we love people so much, we love our family so much, that the only thing that we can do is give them Jesus. And again, don't hear what I'm not saying. It's not, it's not a sin to give your kids good stuff. It's not, a, it's not a sin to have resources. I'm not saying that. But please don't make that your idol. Please don't make that what you worship. And so we're going to come up and sing these songs, and we're going to just do a little uh, moment of prayer, and we're going to partake uh, in communion together as a family to hopefully, because of this, we can remember what Christ did for us. So everyone stand. Everyone take the first few uh, moments as our, our, uh, our deacons and our leaders come up to share communion. But as they are getting ready, I want you to prepare your hearts and your mind for the ceremony that we're about to partake in.